uh, welcome to this uh, 26th class in our uh, physics of materials course. Um, in the uh, last few classes, uh, we have looked at the Drude Sommerfield model and uh, tried to understand uh, what uh, improvements it has over the Drude model. Uh, specifically, we were able to identify that uh, you know there is a, a density of states expression that uh, the Drude Sommerfield model uh, uh, enables for us to generate. Uh, and, uh, if you take that into account along with the Fermi Dirac statistics, uh, which the Drude Sommerfield model uh, um, uh, creates, uh, I mean, uh, uh, enforces on the uh, uh, system, then we find that the picture of uh, what is the distribution of uh, electrons across energy levels uh, changes uh, quite significantly. So, uh, in this relation, uh, we made a couple of different plots. So, we will start with those two plots. Uh, we basically said that uh, we have uh, uh, the Fermi Dirac distribution that looks like this. This is energy and this is F of E. So, we have this and this is the E Fermi energy of the order of uh, say 2.5 electron volts. Uh, and uh, so, this is the way in which the uh, uh, probability of occupancy uh, is distributed. This is the probability of occupancy across various energy levels. And then uh, we also have uh, the density of states, uh, which gives us something like this d of e as a function of e uh, looks like this. Uh, it goes as uh, e power half and so you see a distribution that looks like this and then we have uh, the uh, density of occupancy which is simply 2 of f of e d of e and this 2 takes into account the fact that we can have 2 electrons per state, if you have not accounted for spin and therefore, you have this uh, function. And so, it is simply the density of occupancy is simply the density of available states times the probability of occupancy. So, uh, we see a behavior that looks something like this. So, uh, that is how that would come and at higher temperatures, this would just get modified to something that looks like this. Okay. So, that is the way it would uh, get modified as you raise the temperature. So, this is at T 0, this is at T 1 greater than T 0. Okay. So, uh, these are the uh, uh, expressions that we have. Um, we use this n a bit often, so we have to just be a little cautious on what uh, we are referring to at each stage, so that uh, we follow what is going on. Uh, so, we will start with the expressions actually for d of e and uh, we also had an expression for the uh, number of uh, available states um, up to a certain energy level, total number of available states. So, those expressions are uh, as we have here, we have uh, n of e equals 1 by 6 pi square 2 m a square by h bar square to the power 3 by 2 e to the power 3 by 2. This is now the number of the total number of states uh, below um, up to an energy E. Okay. So, this is the total number of states available up to an energy E. Uh, and we wrote density of states, which is simply uh, uh, a differential, uh, if you differentiate the uh, expression above with respect to E, we write D of E. is simply 1 by 4 pi square. If we differentiate it, the 3 by 2 will come here, that will become 1 by 4 pi square, um, 2 m a square by h bar square to the power 3 by 2 
e power half. Okay, so, this is the uh, expressions we have for density of uh, uh, available states and the total number of available states uh, up to an energy e. Uh, incidentally, we can also pull this, uh, this a is actually the extent of the system. Uh, we uh, actually said that uh, uh, the, uh, we looked at a potential well of uh, dimension a and that is how this a came about. So, if you, uh, if you say that, uh, that potential well is therefore, the extent of the system so to speak. Uh, this a power a square power 3 by 2 will, will actually come out as a cube okay? and that a cube is simply uh, if you want to extend this uh, system into three dimensions it is a, a cube of volume a and you can think of it as, as though the uh, particle is now trapped within a cube of volume a. So, that is the uh, manner in which we could look at this. So, therefore, uh, uh, the two expressions can actually now also be written as uh, um, n of e is uh, this a square power 3 by 2 will become a cube, which is simply the volume v of the system v by 6 pi square um, 2 m by h bar square to the power 3 by 2 e power 3 by 2 and d of e is similarly v by 4 pi square uh, 2 m by h bar square to the power 3 by 2 e power half. Right. Now, our, uh, so these are the expressions, we will use these uh, expressions uh, in a moment uh, for a purpose that uh, we are interested in. Um, our immediate purpose actually uh, is that, uh, so far we have descriptively looked at uh, how the Drude Sommerfeld model actually does a better job of explaining the electronic contribution to specific heat uh, relative to the Drude model. So far, it, uh, as I mentioned, it has been a descriptive uh, uh, a manner in which we have looked at how it is an improvement. Um, right now, given that we have these expressions, we can go a step forward and actually try and see if we can put a numerical value down as to uh, how this is uh, actually a better way of uh, looking at the uh, problem that we have tried to address, which is the uh, uh, contribution of uh, el the electronic contribution to the specific heat. Right. So, uh, what we will do is. Uh, uh, we will uh, now look at uh, the, uh, um, this is the density of states at a given energy level E. Okay. So, what is that energy level? We have not specified, we, it is a variable, we have in our system a variable. So, this is the density of states available at that energy level E. Okay. So, therefore, uh, if you write this in terms of uh, uh, the Fermi energy. Okay. So, as we mentioned, since the system is uh, built up in such a way that you have uh, energy levels uh, from the lowest energy level available. Uh, which get filled up to uh, higher and higher energy level uh, levels and then eventually you run out of electrons in the system uh, and uh, at that point you reach a, uh, the highest energy level uh, uh, in that system. That highest energy level at 0 Kelvin is the Fermi energy level. Now, uh, given that all those states are occupied, uh, when you try to raise the temperature of that system, electrons in uh, energy levels which are uh, relatively low cannot participate in the process because when they gain energy, they will have to go to an, uh, to an energy level above them but all the energy levels immediately above them are fully occupied, because the probability of occupancy is 1. Therefore, only electrons which are very close to the Fermi energy can participate in this uh, energy raise process, okay, uh, which, which is occurring as you try and raise the uh, temperature of the system. Therefore, it is of interest to us to first figure out what is the density of states, density of, uh, um, in this case, it will, it will uh, this is an expression for density of available states, but we are looking at uh, the states uh, just below the Fermi energy and at 0 Kelvin they are all fully occupied. So, therefore, this would also then be the density of occupied states. Uh, so, density of uh, occupied states uh, uh, which is very close to the uh, uh, Fermi energy level. Okay. So, that is what uh, we are looking at. So, this we will write this D subscript E f and so that is just the energy level that we are interested in and that is simply V by 4 pi square um, 2 m by h bar square to the power 3 by 2 and this is E f, the Fermi energy power half. Okay. So, this is the uh, uh, density of uh, um, available states very close to the Fermi energy and therefore, uh, in fact, if it is, if you are talking of just below the Fermi energy, then these are also the density of occupied states very close to the Fermi uh, energy. Okay. So, uh, um, then uh, we, we would also look at uh, the, uh, we can also look at the expression for the total number of states that again was written with respect to a general energy that we have not specified. We will now write it as the total number of states uh, available up to the Fermi energy. 
this is the total number of states available up to the Fermi energy. Okay, so, this is what we have. So, we have an expression for total number of states available up to the Fermi energy and density of states at the Fermi energy. Right? So, these are the two expressions we have. Uh, what we will do is, is, we are just trying to come up with an expression that is convenient for us uh, in, in our final uh, analysis of what is going to happen as you raise the temperature of the system. So, given the expressions that we have, that we, have we are simply going to play with these expressions till we are able to reach something that is convenient for us to interpret or convenient, uh, convenient for us to uh, demonstrate what is happening as you raise the temperature of the system okay, and therefore, uh, convenient for us to interpret. So, we will just take a ratio of these, many of these terms will therefore, get uh, cancelled. So, if you write d of e of f divided by n of e of f. Okay, so, you have uh, 1 by 4 here and you have uh, 1 by 6 here. right? So, uh, it will become 6 by 4 that is 3 by 2. Uh, these two terms will simply get cancelled and you have a e power half by e uh, I mean e f power half by e f power 3 by 2. So, that is simply 1 by e f. Okay, so, almost all the I mean basically most of the terms get cancelled you just get this constant 3 by 2 1 by e f. So, therefore, density of states very close to the Fermi energy is simply the this is then the number of uh, states up to the Fermi energy by e f. And these are all calculations we have done. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, so if you uh, think of it as a per unit volume basis, then this would then be uh, the uh, total number of uh, uh, free electrons per unit volume because this is then the density of occupied states. Uh, this is now uh, total number of uh, available uh, states uh, below the free uh, Fermi energy. And since they are all occupied uh, at zero Kelvin, uh, they, they, this also in, uh, essentially uh, um, takes into account the total number of electrons per unit volume uh, at that uh, in that system. So we can also write this as, uh, at, or at least we would be in the right order of magnitude if we write it as number of free electrons per unit volume by E f. Okay, so this is what uh, we have. Now, uh, uh, this is an expression we have which we will use, we will go back to our diagram. So, uh, uh, the point uh, we uh, we note this is energy of course, is that uh, as we mentioned all the states are occupied up to the Fermi energy level. right? So, only states very close to the Fermi energy level are in a position to participate in the energy rise uh, that occurs in the system as you try to raise the temperature. Now, when you are sitting at 0 Kelvin, this is all fully occupied. So, when you raise the temperature to T, Okay, so, effectively the uh, in terms of a, on a per electron basis, okay, so the uh, amount of energy you are providing is k b t of the order of k b t. Okay, so, on a per electron basis of the order of k b t is the en amount of energy you are providing into the system. So, therefore, if you see uh, only electrons since that is all the energy you are providing on a per electron basis, only electrons within k b t of this uh, Fermi energy level can participate in this energy rise system, because only those electrons can gain this amount of energy and reach states which are empty ahead of them. Okay. If you go further down, there are electrons which in, in theory you could add k b t to an electron that is sitting here and that would probably bring it to some position here. Just for illustrative purposes, we will say it is it's an, uh, it's an electron that is sitting here and that is it is now brought to an energy level that is sitting here. Now, these states are already occupied, whatever states are available at that energy are already occupied. So, therefore, uh, this electron here is not in a position to gain that energy. Okay. In theory, I mean nothing prevents it from gaining the energy, but there is no state where it can go to. It is not 
gaining energy independent of all constraints. It is gaining energy within the constraints placed on the system and the constraints ensure that what is ahead of it is already occupied. So, an electron here cannot gain k b t, whereas an electron which is just within this band within k b t of uh, this Fermi energy can gain k b t and find uh, locations ahead of it which are empty. Therefore, only electrons In our diagram here, it is T 1, but okay, we will say, say it raised to a temperature T. Only electrons within K B T of the Fermi energy can uh, uh, gain energy when the temperature is raised uh, to T. Okay. So, uh, how many of these electrons are there? To get an idea of that, we simply have to look at the density of states, which is very at the Fermi energy level and multiply it by K B T. If you assume that the, uh, if we make, a, we are making an approximation here that this drop off is not very severe. See, uh, eventually, this is, uh, it is going to drop this way, uh, the number of uh, energy levels is going to drop this way. So, therefore, the density of uh, uh, density of uh, occupied states, density of available states, but it is probability of occupancy is 1. So, density of occupied states uh, is going to decrease, but we are saying that the k b t is a very small uh, relatively small number and therefore, uh, within k b t of the Fermi energy, within this k b t of Fermi energy, there is not a very significant drop in the density of states. So, the total number of uh, uh, electrons that can participate in this process uh, is the density of uh, uh, electrons available per unit energy at the Fermi energy times this k b t. Okay. So, therefore, uh, number of electrons d of E f times k b t, which we have already found is simply 3 by 2 n f by E f times k b t. So, this is now the number of electrons in the system uh, on a per unit volume basis, if you want to say, uh, which can now gain energy uh, as a result of the rise in temperature. Okay. So, we have the k b t term already here, but this is still this total term that here come works out to uh, essentially is talking of the number of electrons that can participate or uh, number of electrons per unit volume, which can participate in this gain of energy as you raise the temperature uh, to a temperature T. Okay. So, k b t is the uh, uh, width of the, uh, uh, I mean is the range of uh, uh, energy values over which the uh, electrons can gain energy. Now, we have already seen that uh, the energy of an uh, uh, electron uh, at a temperature T as given by the uh, uh, ideal gas behavior and so on uh, is simply is simply 3 by 2 k b t. This is the energy associated with an electron, actually energy associated with a particle at temperature t as given by the uh, uh, classical uh, behavior, uh, but we are just assuming that you know the, the only thing we have changed is the introduction of Fermi Dirac statistics uh, and therefore, uh, and then uh, the quantization. But uh, in principle, uh, we will assume that this is still the energy that uh, is associated with an electron uh, at temperature T. Therefore, the uh, uh, gain in energy by uh, raise of temperature is equal to number of electrons. Uh, participating in the process uh, 
times the uh, energy per electron, energy gain per electron. Okay, so, the gain in energy due to a raise of temperature uh, if for the system is simply the number of electrons participating in this process uh, uh, of this uh, change in temperature times the energy gain per, uh, per electron. Okay, so, we have uh, now got expressions for both. So, this is simply equal to, uh, so if you want to write this, this is E. Okay, so, this is the energy E, this is the number of electrons uh, participating in the process uh, uh, that is 3 by 2 uh, N f by E f times k b t that is the first term here number of electrons participating in the process times the electron uh, the energy gained per electron which is this 3 by 2 k b t. Okay, so, this is what uh, we have now got for the uh, expression. So, we have actually played around with a lot of numbers uh, and expressions and come up with something that uh, uh, is beginning to look like uh, uh, an expression that we can uh, uh, handle for our immediate purposes. So, if you multiply, I mean if you simplify this expression, you have 9 by 4 n f by e f k b square t square. So, this is what we have as the total energy that is uh, uh, being introduced into the system as you raise the uh, temperature of the system to a temperature t. Okay. So, this is what uh, we have got. So, therefore, if you now want to look at the, uh, 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 the specific heat contribution as a result of this raise in energy, we simply have to differentiate this with respect to temperature. So, E equals uh, what we just wrote down 9 by 4 n f by E f k b square t square. Okay. So, this is the expression we have, uh, where this is the Fermi energy, this is the total number of free electrons per unit volume. So, therefore, C v E the uh, contribution, the electronic contribution to specific heat at constant volume is d e by d t and that is simply 9 by 2 uh, n f by e f k b square t. Okay, so, this is the uh, uh, expression that we have. Um, so, we have actually again uh, the, to once again emphasize this is uh, we should always keep in mind that this is only the electronic contribution to the specific heat. This is not the total specific heat of the solid. You make a measurement for the specific heat of the solid, this is not the value you will get. If you can isolate the electronic contribution to the specific heat, that is the value you will get, because there are a lot of other constituents in the solid, which we are ignoring in this current calculation. Okay. So, that is all the atoms that are present are all being ignored and all the other electrons, which are bound electrons they are also being ignored. So, the entire system is now a much uh, a very specific system that we are looking at. Okay. So, this is what we have. Now, this is an expression that has a few terms here. Uh, we will actually uh, simplify this a little further. Uh, we noted in the last class uh, specifically, we looked at uh, uh, Fermi energy, Fermi surface and Fermi temperature. These are all things that we uh, uh, discussed in, uh, in our previous class. Uh, in that, we specifically said that uh, uh, the Fermi energy E f can be equated to a Fermi temperature T f with this expression, just the way you would have k b t for any uh, for the uh, energy contribution at uh, uh, approximately uh, k b t as the energy contribution for uh, at a temperature T. We will uh, say that this energy can be equated to some uh, temperature okay, T f. So, that is this T f. So, therefore, uh, E f by k b is this temperature. Fermi temperature T f. All right. uh, if you look at our expression here, we have the inverse of this, we have actually k b square we have, but if you just take it as k b times k b, we have a k b by e f here. Okay. So, a k b by e f and an another k b t is sitting there. So, a k b by e f is there, which is an inverse of this. So, so we can replace k b by e f as 1 by T f. So, this is simply C v e is uh, 9 by 2 n f. Uh, k b t by t f okay, 9 by 2 n f n f is still there one of the k b's will still remain. So, n f k b will remain uh, this t is still here. So, the other k b by e f is being replaced by 1 by t f. So, that is what we have got here. Okay. So, uh, so, what we have here is the contribution to specific heat electronic contribution to specific heat is some constant number of free electrons per unit volume times the Boltzmann's constant 
times a ratio of uh, two temperatures. One is the temperature that the system is is at. So, uh, so we have moved to. So, if you are talking of you know a few hundred Kelvin, that is the kind of temperature we are talking of here. And this is the Fermi temperature, so T f, okay, which is defined for a system. Now, uh, when we also looked at the Fermi temperature, uh, okay, we have, we have some particular values for Fermi temperature. We will, we will uh, uh, look at that in just a moment. Uh, in this, so, this is the expression. There are some approximations made in this. Uh, this is not uh, the most rigorous expression that you can get. But in principle, this is the expression that you will get with respect to the uh, root Sommerfeld model. A much more rigorous expression can be derived, with, where some of these constants will change slightly. But in principle, this feature will show up. Okay, so this uh, T by T f and other things will show up. So a much more rigorous expression can be de derived, but uh, for our purposes, this is uh, adequate. Um, so this is what we get from the root Sommerfeld model. So, the root Sommerfeld model gives us the electronic contribution to specific heat as this particular expression. Um, if you look at the or, uh, expression that we previously had, this was the expression for the specific heat at constant volume, electronic contribution to specific heat at constant volume as predicted by the root model. So, this is an expression that is uh, a not uh, in a, I mean is basically the same expression that you get from the uh, ideal gas behavior. Okay. So, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics is used. Uh, if you use Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, uh, then you are talking of, uh, of an ideal gas, uh, a particle uh, collection of particles that behave like an ideal gas, uh, and then this is the expression that you would get, and this is what we uh, derived in one of our earlier classes. In our present derivation, we have taken the root Sommerfeld model which has replaced the uh, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics by the Fermi Dirac statistics. And then we have come up with a lot of uh, uh, features associated with uh, that replacement. We have seen all those features which is the uh, Fermi energy, the uh, uh, Fermi surface, uh, the uh, Fermi temperature and so on. And uh, uh, relative to that, this is the expression we have got for the uh, specific heat at constant volume. Uh, what we uh, said also is that uh, experimentally if you measure this uh, uh, process, if you measure the uh, electronic contribution to specific heat, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a measurement that you can uh, in, in, uh, uh, in practice uh, this is mostly done at very low temperatures, uh, typically uh, in the range of 0 to 1 Kelvin. So, that is the temperature range at which uh, uh, this is uh, a more significant contribution. Uh, relative to the contribution of the rest of the material. Even at much, much higher temperatures, this can become, become a significant contribution. But uh, uh, So, in most intermediate range of temperatures that we will measure, uh, you will only see the uh, contribution of the other constituents of the solid in, in, in significant quantities. Uh, so, in experimental sense, typically low temperature measurements are being made to get this uh, uh, electronic contribution to specific heat. Uh, and of the order of, I mean those are really low temperatures, those are not you know um, tens of degrees or 0 degrees C. They are, we are looking at uh, uh, minus close to minus 273 degrees C, uh, effectively uh, 0 to 1 Kelvin. So, that is the temperature range where you make this measurement. Um, so, that is how you would experimentally get it. Experimentally, when it is determined, this it is found that this expression here, the root model uh, uh, prediction for the uh, uh, electronic contribution to specific heat at constant volume is uh, larger than what is experimentally uh, uh, measured by a factor of 100. Okay, so, of the order of two orders of magnitude, this value is higher than what is measured. Okay, so, now let us see there are uh, if you compare it with this, uh, if you look at the new expression that we have got for the root Sommerfeld model, you will find this N f k b shows up in both of them. So, therefore, uh, this is more or less the same uh, as before. Uh, we have some constant up here, this is 9 by 2, this is 3 by 2, but that is not a very significant thing. Uh, they are in the same order of magnitude anyways. So, this much is essentially the same. So, uh, what is really different is this T by T f. Okay, so, T by T f is the new uh, thing that we have introduced uh, effectively uh, in our uh, prediction through the uh, root Sommerfeld model. So, we will just need to look at this value of T by T f a little bit. If you look at T, uh, if you are looking at room temperature for example, this is of the order of 300 Kelvin. Okay. And uh, T f is the Fermi temperature.
if you look at the uh, fermi energy that uh, most uh, the of uh, of typical metallic systems uh, if you look at the fermi energy that they will have uh, if you do the calculation given uh, uh, the given that we know what is the approximate number of uh, free electrons per unit volume if you do the calculations and so on uh, given the fermi energy if you calculate uh, the uh, fermi temperature corresponding to this that fermi energy we find that fermi temperature is approximately of the order of uh, say 20000 kelvin of this order okay so 20000 kelvin is a is a uh, temperature that uh, fermi temperature that uh, uh, that is uh, 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 that can be attributed to the fermi energy in in, say in, in a typical metallic system so uh, if you simply take a ratio of these two, so T by T f is therefore, so this is uh, of the order of uh, ten, that is of the order of 10 power 2, this is of the order of 10 power 4. So, this is of the order of 10 power minus 2. Okay. So, this is of the order of 10 power minus 2. Uh, simply T by T f gives us a uh, 10 power minus 2 as the ratio of the two of them. And that is all the difference that we are really looking at. We said that the Drude model over predicts the uh, um, electronic contribution to specific heat by a factor of 100. Uh, and we have now got an expression through the Drude Sommer field model, which is adding one additional term T by T f into the uh, equation. Uh, and we find that the ratio of T by T f is such that uh, that is of the order of 10 power minus 2. So, therefore, if this is off by a factor of 100, you are multiplying it by 10 power minus 2. So, you are now in the right order of magnitude. Okay. So, uh, therefore, this is a uh, we have uh, successfully shown that uh, the Drude Sommerfield model uh, actually takes care of one significant drawback that the Drude model had. Okay. One of the most significant drawbacks that the Drude, Drude model had uh, has now been uh, appropriately accounted for by making the changes that the Drude Sommerfield model uh, introduced into or that in fact Sommerfield introduced into the process uh, and uh, the and therefore, the changes uh, in expressions that were caused due to those. Uh, uh, fundamental changes in the uh, uh, system that were uh, introduced. Okay, so uh, uh, therefore we see. I mean, till now we uh, I uh, I showed you through diagrams uh, uh, why the two of them might differ. Uh, the uh, uh, in in these predictions because uh, the Maxwell Boltzmann statistic says that all the electrons can participate in the process, right? So that is why the energy associated with that process is significant. Uh, Drude uh, Sommerfeld uh, model using Fermi Dirac statistics says only electrons close to the Fermi energy can participate in the process. That is essentially the difference in this calculation versus this calculation. Okay, so, here we specifically accounted for all those uh, uh, number of electrons close to the Fermi energy uh, and within k b t of the Fermi energy, we said they can participate in the process. Uh, then we looked at the density of states at the Fermi energy, multiplied them, uh, multiplied that by the factor uh, uh, 3 by 2 k b t, which is the uh, amount of energy associated with uh, each electron. So, uh, uh, it taking all that into account, we uh, arrived at this uh, expression. Okay, so, so this is the uh, so we find that in fact, uh, if you look at how everything has uh, turned out, uh, seemingly the the may the specific factor introduced by the Sommerfeld model, which is T by T f, uh, uh, specifically accounts for this problem, takes care of this problem and solves it, uh, solves it to our satisfaction. It gets us into the correct order of magnitude for this prediction. And as I mentioned, in this kind of uh, analysis getting us into the correct order of magnitude uh, uh, is the uh, is, is something that is uh, very valuable to us uh, is something that we uh, uh, then accept okay so of course we we have to accept all the uh, as we have already seen with the drude model sometimes you can get into the correct order of magnitude uh, without uh, um, with uh, two errors cancelling out so that is not something that is uh, uh, useful to us uh, and so this is uh, takes into account all of that and gets us into the correct order of magnitude so once again, uh, I'll just uh, uh, highlight this fact that when we uh, we I mentioned this earlier, uh, this is a very large number, twenty thousand Kelvin. Uh, so we need to understand that uh, uh, this does not mean that your uh, material is sitting at twenty thousand Kelvin. Clearly, we are talking of a material sitting at room temperature. Okay, so three hundred Kelvin, so or of the of that order. If you started from zero Kelvin, you raise the temperature to a few hundred Kelvin. Uh, we are simply saying that. Uh, in in that material you have a lot of atoms you have a lot of electrons that are bound to those atoms all of those are at uh, the uh, at, at around this temperature and they uh, they represent a very significant thermal mass so to speak uh, then amongst the free electrons also you have electrons which are at very relatively low energy uh, going up to higher and higher energies this is simply uh, the fermi energy is simply the highest energy occupied by very 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 small fraction of uh, electrons present within the system okay uh, or at least 
uh, yeah, it is a very small fraction of electrons present within the system. It is also an extremely tiny amount of the thermal mass of the system, which is what is sitting at that uh, at that energy level. And as a distribution, therefore, it is at the uh, tail of the distribution uh, or the leading edge of the distribution. Uh, and that uh, extreme end of that distribution alone is sitting at, uh, if it can be, is, is sitting at some energy which, if it can be converted to a temperature, would correspond to this temperature. So that is the uh, um, sort of the framework within which we understand the fact that the Fermi temperature is 20,000 Kelvin. It is like saying that within an within a material sitting at room temperature, there is an electron sitting at 20,000 Kelvin. It is loosely speaking that is the way we would like to. Um, uh, rationalize the fact that there is a 20,000 Kelvin uh, temperature in that system. Okay. So, so this is what it is, but uh, given that this is 20,000 Kelvin and this is consistent with the Fermi energy of the system, T by T f works out to 10 power minus 2, which solves all our problems. Right. So, um, to summarize where we have come so far, uh, we have uh, uh, looked at the Drude model, identified problems with it and systematically solved them using the Drude Sommer field model. And uh, what we have done today uh, is a demonstration that uh, numerically uh, we, we can see that the Drude Sommer field model has succeeded in a very specific example where the Drude model failed. Okay. So, this is the uh, success that we have had. So, uh, having come this far, we, we understand that we have made an improvement, Drude Sommer field model has is an improvement. So, it is therefore necessary for us to uh, stop and uh, consider uh, what is the further scope for improvement from this model. Okay. What, is, what are issues that perhaps even this model is not really uh, addressing. If you look at it from that perspective, what you see is that the Drude Sommerfeld model uh, is actually still using certain basic ideas of the original Drude model, which is that it is a free electron gas. Okay. And it also says that you know other things are all equal, it is not significantly looking at, at least in the, in the extent that we have developed it so far, uh, it has not significantly looked at uh, any of the uh, impact of the uh, details of the material. Right. So, for example, we wrote, uh, we made this diagram saying that the a distribution of potential within the system uh, is uh, in, a, in a solid can be described with a diagram that looks something like this. So, this would be energy. this would be position and this is, these are the positions of the ionic cores. So, these are the x coordinates of those ionic cores and these are the bound uh, uh, electron uh, uh, energy values. Okay. So, this is what we have and this is what the Fermi energy is. Right. So, this is what we have. Uh, when we looked at the uh, contribution to specific heat, we have basically only looked at uh, the topmost layer of this, uh, this entire collection of electrons, this topmost layer how it participates in specific heat process. So, that is what we have uh, looked at. Now, uh, in, in terms of other properties say electronic properties and so on, in principle uh, uh, we have not really changed a whole lot from uh, uh, with respect to how the uh, process is occurring, uh, so to speak. Um, one of the uh, issues that we still have in, in our uh, description uh, is that uh, if you look at a typical solid, you take uh, any uh, uh, material, uh, let us say uh, any uh, metallic system, silver, copper and so on. Uh, in most metallic systems, uh, if you take a single crystal of that solid, okay, a single crystal meaning uh, from one end to the other end, all the planes are in perfect uh, atomic order. If you take a single crystal of the solid, uh, we uh, discussed this earlier that uh, when you measure properties across the single crystal you will find that based on the direction in which you are measuring the property, the property can change significantly. A, a, a classic example is in fact, for example, something like uh, carbon, where you can have, of course, that is not uh, exactly metallic, but uh, if you look at carbon, uh, you can find that, you know, in, in uh, if it has a, a structure where there are planes of uh, carbon atoms, along the plane, the electronic conductivity is excellent. Okay. A perpendicular to the planes, the conductivity is terrible. So, you can have, it is more or less an insulator perpendicular to the planes, it is an electronic conductor uh, along the planes. So, uh, the, uh, this is basically the term we use for this is anisotropy. Okay. So, anisotropy exists Anisotropy exists in uh, uh, many systems, 
uh, and it can be very glaringly uh, experienced or uh, measured. So, it is not uh, something that is very, it is not something that is just a subtle thing that a minor uh, correction that you need to throw in. You can, uh, the property can change by several orders of magnitude depending on the direction in which you are measuring the property. Okay. So, uh, up until now the calculation that we have done, calculations that we have done have uh, in no way captured the uh, directionality of the property. Okay. So, uh, nothing that we have done so far, uh, when we say uh, number of free electrons per unit volume, that number of free electrons per unit volume is the same regardless of which direction you are looking at, because it is per on a per unit volume basis and the per, per unit volume has no uh, uh, direction associated with it. right? So, it is an n f is simply the same number, uh, the uh, uh, Fermi temperature is the same temperature so to speak. So, uh, um, well more specifically the n f is the same uh, value and uh, therefore, uh, you do not really have any uh, uh, variation uh, in say the property from in uh, based on which direction you are looking at. So, uh, what is the, uh, what uh, we need to consider for a moment, what is it that is inherent to the material that uh, dictates that one direction is different from another direction. Okay. What is inherent to the material that is that dictates that any one direction is different from an another direction regardless of how it is different is something that we have to consider. The thing that differentiates between directions is the crystal structure. So, the crystal structure now has uh, there are crystal axes, there are uh, angles associated with these axes, there are uh, uh, unit vectors associated with these uh, axes depending on the uh, material you are looking at. So, that is a very specific structural uh, information that exists about the system. Okay. In our calculation so far, we have not accounted for this structural information in any manner in our calculation so far strictly speaking. Okay. So, if you go back to uh, this diagram here. Uh, the uh, crystal structure information, so to speak, even in a one dimensional sense, we have uh, this diagram is drawn for a one dimensional uh, solid. Uh, we will assume that we are still talking of a one dimensional solid, uh, so that our analysis is then consistent with whatever we have done, but at the same time uh, more and more details are incorporated into the analysis. Uh, in this one dimensional solid, the crystal structure information, so to speak, comes from the uh, information on what is this spacing, so to speak. Right? These are the ionic cores they are the ones that are sitting at those crystal lattice points. right? So, the crystal lattice is, uh, is now uh, decorated with these particular atoms or if you want to call, uh, if you want to call them as atoms or if not as ionic cores, those ions are sitting at those specific lattice points. So, the positions of these ionic cores uh, therefore, uh, represents the uh, in this information, the crystal structure in uh, information. All right? so, uh, if you are saying that anisotropy uh, is in some ways related to the fact that the crystal structure is anisotropic with respect to different directions. right? So, if you look at uh, uh, spacing between ions in one direction, it is different from spacing uh, between ions in another direction, uh, the uh, angles in which they are laid out is different and so on. So, if the, the spacing is different uh, and so on, the that information is directly from the crystal structure, which is directly being represented by these locations. right? So, therefore, uh, one of the things that we have to understand is uh, what is the impact of these ionic cores sitting at these locations on the behavior of the electrons which are sitting up here. Right? So far we have actually separated this picture, so far we have said that these are nearly free electrons which are free to roam through the solid, we have used uh, and mathematically incorporated that information in different ways, but we have basically said that these are nearly free electrons, they are free to run uh, across the extent of the solid. Uh, and these are bound electrons which are bound to those ionic cores, these are the energy levels corresponding to those bound electrons bound to these ionic cores. And we separated these two, we sort of said that this is independent behavior relative to all of this. Uh, in fact, one of the assumptions that we made is that we kept saying that uh, the uh, potential is uh, sort of uniform throughout the solid, there is no interaction, there is no, uh, we did not put in any detail for the interaction between these electrons and what the ionic cores in the system uh, provide, the environment provided by those ionic cores. Okay. Uh, we simply said that we put in one averaged term for the resistive uh, uh, forces that the electron experiences as it travels through the uh, system. So, we had actually neglected any impact of uh, these ionic cores on those free electrons. Right? So, uh, of course, as a, for a calculation that is fine, you can always say that I am neglecting a certain effect and we are running a certain calculation. 
and uh, to the extent that we neglected this we still have made very good predictions on a number of things several things we have predicted correctly even certain errors we made earlier on we have even corrected those so therefore all that is fine so what we are saying is that now this additional information that we see about the material which is the anisotropy of the material has somehow not been captured by whatever calculations we have done so far right so uh, we find that that information comes from uh, is already there in this picture in the form of these ionic the pre locations of these ionic cores so therefore uh, we understand that somehow the location of these ionic cores also impacts the behavior of these electrons okay uh, only thing is we have not actually incorporated that uh, uh, process we have not incorporated uh, this uh, detail into our system so what we need to do is we need to understand uh, um, in, in a, and in our analysis since we are using the quantum mechanical description we can uh, think of the electrons as particles or as waves uh, we would like to understand what is the interaction of this uh, wave like behavior of electrons with this periodic structure of uh, ionic cores that is present uh, in the system okay so uh, so this is the direction in which we will head in the next uh, uh, few classes uh, to do this we will sort, sort of have to separate uh, uh, we will have to take a two step uh, uh, approach first we will look at the ionic cores and how they interact with waves in general regardless of whether they are electron waves uh, and so on okay so we will look at them as how they interact with uh, waves in general which is effectively the diffraction process so to speak but not just that we will specifically use uh, the uh, since we are already using k vector so to speak the wave vector k is 2 pi by lambda which is in the uh, units of uh, uh, 1 by so this is the wave vector corresponding to these electrons here okay we will use similar 1 by uh, uh, length dimensions and in that context 1 by length dimensions one by length is simply reciprocal of length okay so we will look at the interaction of waves with ionic cores in a uh, in a descriptive uh, uh, framework which consists of uh, the reciprocal of length such a framework is referred to as reciprocal space okay in reciprocal space so we will develop this concept called reciprocal space we will later relate it we will find how it relates to real space so we will see reciprocal space as a separate entity we will see how it relates to so that reciprocal space will now contain all this crystal structure information in reciprocal uh, uh, of length units we already understand how it might be in uh, real uh, length units we have you in the uh, early uh, uh, crystallographic uh, courses that you would have done you would have seen that so we already understand crystal structure in real space as we call it the normal uh, xyz uh, space we will look at crystal structure and what it represents in reciprocal space we will see how uh, diffraction can be described uh, in real space which we already understand and how the same description can be given to us in reciprocal space so we will understand reciprocal space from those perspectives so therefore we will understand the uh, uh, manner in which the presence of ionic cores um, uh, impacts or interacts uh, with the uh, with waves present in the system uh, within the description given to us by the reciprocal space so this we will learn as an independent uh, process then we will relate uh, what we will do is having understood that as an independent process we will uh, we will take into account the fact that the electrons that are in the solid are showing us wave like behavior okay and as far as the uh, as far as the uh, description of uh, the diffraction process is concerned or the interaction between waves and uh, uh, the ionic cores is concerned it doesn't really matter where the wave is coming from whether it is being uh, externally introduced into the system or it is something that is within the system therefore we will be able to extend our analysis of reciprocal space and uh, diffractional processes within uh, from this framework uh, where we are just talking of uh, independent set of waves interacting with a uh, periodic structure which is what we will find under reciprocal space that description and that discussion and the results that we get there can be extended and directly incorporated into a situation where we are looking at the interaction of these waves with this periodic structure okay so that is all the information that we want we want to know what is the impact of this periodic structure on the behavior of these waves that are up there okay so to speak in energy level when we do that we have incorporated the uh, periodicity of the structure into the picture that we have uh, described and the picture already has many other details which are right taken together this periodicity of the structure plus all the wave description of that uh, uh, of the electrons that are in the system we will have a much more complete picture of the solid 
with all with a significant amount of detail of the solid, uh, which is now which now incorporates even its crystal structure. Presumably, at that point, we will now also be able to see the anisotropy of the behavior of the uh, uh, phenomena that we are examining. Okay. So, therefore, in the next class, we will head off towards our discussion of reciprocal space, uh, and it will it will look like a separate discussion at least initially till we come back and we put it back into this picture and uh, add on add on all of these details and then see what is the impact of uh, the reciprocal structure on that uh, uh, on the electrons that are moving okay so it is in this direction that we will proceed before we get a uh, even better uh, even better and much more uh, improved uh, understanding of the system from a theoretical perspective okay so we will halt here today and we will uh, take it up in the next class thank you